It's five past the hour, and we have an exciting agenda to walk through today that begins with foundation updates led by our CEO, Keith Elliston. So, Keith, I'd like to uh, turn this over to you and uh, get our call started. Sounds good, Kevin. Thanks. Appreciate that. Uh, let me make sure I've got the right window up here so I can see what we're doing. Great. Um, so just on the agenda today, we're going to run through uh, some quick updates. Um, uh, then uh, train, uh, we'll have a training update that Ruby will give us. We'll have a run over the, uh, the calendar. Uh, and then uh, we're pleased today to have a, a really nice presentation of the experience of rolling out version 1.2 on an enterprise-wide level. Uh, the team from Pfizer who's been responsible for that rollout is going to take us through their experience, uh, the lessons learned, uh, etc. And then we'll have a question and answers period after that. Uh, next slide, Kevin. So uh, I just want to give a, a few quick updates um, uh, in terms of what, uh, what's happened in the past month with the foundation. Uh, we've been digging out of the record snowfall here in Boston, but other than that, there, there's been a lot of activity. Um, the membership program uh, is moving forward. Uh, we have a, a new foundation silver member. Phillips has joined uh, the foundation at a silver level. Um, we also uh, will have a board of directors uh, election coming up in, uh, in April. Um, we have one silver seat to be elected. So as you might recall from our bylaws, um, all the silver members as a group can each nominate uh, one uh, potential candidate for this election. That candidate does not need to come from your organization, and uh, different silver members can nominate the same candidate if they're so interested. Um, there will be uh, an opening of those nominations on April 2nd. They'll be open for one week. Um, after that, there will be an election. Uh, for the election, um, each silver member uh, can cast one vote. Um, if we have a tie for that uh, board seat at the end of the election, there'll be a runoff election, and that's in accordance with our bylaws. Uh, and then our goal is to have that, uh, that new member seated at the board meeting uh, on April 20th. Um, a quick update on the 501c3 IRS filings for the foundation. Uh, we heard back from the IRS. Um, there are some new uh, regulations in, in this space, uh, so we had to make some uh, changes to our bylaws and our articles in corporation uh, to meet those regulations. Uh, we did that. We had a board approval uh, via written consent and we filed the updated documents with the IRS. Um, we expect to hear something back from them in the next six to eight weeks uh, following that. So uh, it's good progress on the 501c3. Everything is updated and, and set, and the documents are all in compliance with the Act. So I think uh, we're in good shape there. Uh, I'll let you know when, when we have the formal uh, uh, 501c3 exemption status. Um, another piece of, of really good news for the platform is uh, we've, we've hired uh, a QAQC architect uh, for the foundation. Uh, Jay Farron has joined us, uh, previous experience back at uh, EMC doing commercial uh, product testing and release. Um, he's joined us to work with Terry and Peter to uh, design a full testing and release program uh, for version 1.2 and to architect that as part of what we expect to implement in, in a version 2 architecture as well. Uh, one of the key things the foundation is focusing on is is bringing the platform from a research grade platform to a commercial grade platform. And this is one of the key steps for us and we're very excited to have Jay uh, join us and, and work with us on that. Um, in addition, uh, along the roadmap, um, we have a version 1.3 project that is uh, getting started. We have a couple of uh, key stakeholders that uh, are willing to invest in some new feature development for 1.3. Uh, um, I would like to encourage any other members or, or non-members in the community that have uh, a budget to spend on version 1.3 type features uh, to come together. Um, I think if, if people can pool their resources, uh, the number of features that can be added uh, to the platform uh, can be increased dramatically. Uh, this is one of the key activities of the foundation is really providing this means of, of pooling resources and growing the feature base and feature set uh, of the platform uh, in a way that, that really enhances that capability so that we can all take advantage of, of the community investment uh, overall. So we're recruiting some stakeholders to contribute to this. Um, we're looking for features requests, um, groups that want to contribute some funding to this, um, and you'll be hearing more about this uh, in the near future. Our goal is to get this project uh, underway soon. Uh, to get a set of features developed and have this completed before the end of uh, 2015. 
So this is a, a very near-term project, and if you have any questions or, or comments, uh, please come to me or Kevin Smith uh, with the foundation. Next slide. I uh, wanted to give people a quick uh, update on uh, the foundation membership renewals process. So uh, the key members that joined the foundation in the first year um, have been going through a process of renewal. Um, the renewal dates are set, invoices have been sent. Uh, we've uh, already received uh, over $250,000 from this uh, renewal space. And uh, we're not only working on uh, recruiting new members to the foundation, but also uh, renewing memberships for those uh, that are working forward here. So uh, if you see your name, uh, of the name of your company on there, unless you're the Eunice Server City of Michigan, which I'll have to talk to Steve about. Um, uh, what we'll do is, is you should be expecting invoices coming in, um, et cetera. If you have any questions on this, uh, Steve Johnson, our uh, VP of Finance, is heading this up. Uh, please uh, talk with him if you have any questions about this. Next slide, Kevin. Uh, with that, what I'd like to do is uh, turn this over to, uh, to Rudy to talk a little bit about the training program. And, uh, and go from there. There'll be time for questions and answers at the end. If you have questions on any of the updates or any of the, the foundation materials, we can take those questions at the end. Rudy? Okay, uh, thank you, Keith. Um, we have started our training program in, in earnest now. Uh, hopefully you know that uh, every month, uh, the, the last Monday of the month, uh, we were, are having a free uh, training class. It runs about 90 minutes with 30 minutes of Q&A. Uh, we held our first one in February. We had 13 or 14 people attend, and we already have a number of people registered for the March 30th class. Uh, these are being conducted by uh, Rancho for the uh, earlier, for, for the later time, the noon classes, and Thomson Reuters uh, for the 10 a.m. classes. Uh, and we encourage anyone who wants, uh, who is new to the um, to the platform and just like to get a very basic overview uh, of the system. Uh, to attend these. We do ask you to uh, register ahead of time, but there is no fee uh, for these training classes. And um, it's a good way to get uh, an introduction and get you started uh, using the platform. Next slide. We are also now uh, announcing uh, an advanced training class that we're going to be running two times at BioIT World. Uh, this is going to be an on-site training, so people will be um, at, uh, in the room uh, and uh, receiving um, uh, the, uh, the training in person. Uh, the classes will run uh, generally about two hours. It will cover uh, some more advanced topics, um, how to use some of the new features, um, loading uh, of data, uh, do a lot more detail about how to actually uh, do some of the, the, the cooler things that the platform uh, offers. Uh, and it will end with uh, an hour of uh, just individual practice and uh, a monitored uh, 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 the, the, two, the, the person giving the class uh, assisting you with specific questions and personal attention. Um, we are uh, going to be charging for this class uh, for the first time and uh, we are offering this at uh, $499 and uh, the, uh, you can get more information uh, at the Transmart Foundation website uh, in the training tab uh, and registration will be open for these classes shortly. Uh, we will be running it twice, once a Monday afternoon during our BioIT world, and then repeat it again on Tuesday morning. So that's what, uh, what we're doing on training. Uh, and again, if you have questions and comments, uh, please uh, save them to the end, and we can uh, try to answer your questions. Okay, next slide. Now I'll go through uh, our calendar. We've got three big events uh, coming up, uh, as well as uh, obviously different conferences and things that will be that are being attended. Uh, but mainly we're going to cover BioIT World, our data-thon, and the annual meeting. This just shows the, the dates of the three big events. BioIT World is in just a few weeks uh, in April. Uh, at the end of April, we have our first data-thon on neurodegenerative diseases. Uh, and then in October, we've set now the foundation annual meeting, uh, which will take place uh, in Amsterdam. Uh, and um, again, more details are forthcoming. Uh, other conferences of interest, this is just a few of them, but um, I'm trying to maintain a list of conferences that would be of interest in general. If you are attending a conference, and especially if you are presenting and presenting using the, the Transmart uh, platform, please let me know. I'd love to get uh, this on our calendar as we go forward. So let's go quickly through some of the details of the events that are coming up. We uh, have our first datathon that we're working with, uh, Michael J. Fox Foundation. Uh, University of Michigan, um, a number of uh, partners, 
um, uh, Takeda, Sanofi, uh, Pfizer, uh, University of Luxembourg. Uh, it will take place on April 28th to 30th in Boston. Uh, a lot more details are on our, our website in terms of the, the logistics uh, as, as we are getting things set up. Uh, it will take place at the Thomson Reuters offices. Uh, next slide. There's more detail here. Um, during the datathon, uh, we anticipate having uh, around 20 data scientists, um, uh, a neuro, neuro, neurological um, uh, scientists, as well as uh, biostatisticians attend to actually execute uh, the, the, the work of the datathon. They'll be broken into teams. We will have experts on uh, the system, on the platform available, as well as uh, some of our partners, uh, for example, Perkin Elmer will be participating with Spotfire uh, and making that available for the, the members of the Datathon. Uh, and the expectation is that we'll be, the, the scientists there working will have uh, easy time to, to work through some ideas and, and study the different data sets that will be loaded. Um, a number of data sets will be available during the, the program. Uh, and um, We'll be able to, to actually perform some some interesting work um, that we'll uh, we'll get to see uh, once they're done. Uh, in preparation for this, we're going to have a special training session on the platform, as you can see here on April 13th, and then we're going to run uh, three uh, webinars: uh, one, an introduction to the datathon process and methodology, uh, provided by the by Keith and, and the Michael J. Fox team. Uh, we're going to talk about um, of the data sets and the other, inf other data that's available and resources available on the second one. And then the third day, we'll be doing an overview of the tools that are going to be available. Um, you will need to, to register your interest in attending. Uh, we're, we're going to have to limit the, the attendance here. But if you can go to the Transmark Foundation slash Datathon, you'll have, there's a form that you can fill out and, uh, if you're interested in attending and a lot more detail uh, available there. Okay, next slide. BioAT T World uh, is coming up the week of April 20th. Uh, again, we've got another packed week uh, of activity as we did last year uh, with the training classes kicking us off. Uh, on the Tuesday, we'll have our board of directors meeting, uh, and the three C committees will meet that afternoon. Uh, these the three C committees, code, content, and community will meet one after the other, so if you're interested in more than one committee, certainly you can participate. Um, we encourage you, uh, especially members who are the voting members on these committees, to please you know, come and express your opinions. Uh, all the working groups will be uh, active there, uh, and a number of uh, interesting um, components. And again, uh, we will be updating the website with uh, more information on the agenda and topics of interest uh, for that shortly. On Wednesday, the exhibit hall will be open. We will have a booth there. Uh, we're in uh, booth number 113, I happen to know. Uh, and so that will be uh, open for you to come to visit with us both on Wednesday and Thursday. Um, and then again on Wednesday evening, uh, Deloitte uh, is, is uh, sponsoring a community meeting. So we will have a face-to-face -face community meeting. Uh, will be broadcast, hopefully, uh, on a webinar um, But uh, that evening. Uh, a lot of the focus will be on our content uh, and marketplace, uh, and so we'll have talks and discussion groups around that. Um, those of you, we, we had 100 people attend last year, and I just want to remind you there will be a registration for this. There's no fee, but there will be a registration, and this will facilitate getting through the security in the Deloitte building, which was a bit of a bottleneck uh, last year, so I encourage you to um, use the, the uh, registration that we'll have posted on the website. And then on the Thursday, uh, again, the exhibit hall will be there, and we will have, uh, the foundation has a talk uh, in track 10 uh, on the, the foundation updates. So, again, a very busy week, um, and uh, we hope that you'll, um, you know, consider attending some of these things, uh, especially, you know, the, the three seat committees. Uh, these are the working bodies of the foundation, and uh, a lot of the things that happen and, and get done are accomplished by the committees, and so, we're uh, hoping that you'll uh, you know, take the time to come and participate in these. Uh, it is in the Exchange Conference Center in the Mass Boardroom. And I think my last slide is a little more detail on the, um, the community meeting on Wednesday evening. Uh, and this will have, um, you know, again, hosted by Deloitte. Um, please, uh, if you, uh, tr please try to register because this will certainly help uh, in terms of getting everybody up into the, into the meeting uh, at a reasonable uh, time this time. Um, 
so those are the the, the updated uh, on the uh, events that are coming up uh, and you know please check the website we're trying to keep it up to date and with a lot of information that you can use thanks Rudy okay. yeah go ahead so I'd, I'd like to introduce Anna Silberberg from Pfizer. She is going to lead the Pfizer team through their presentation today um, around lessons learned from the recent upgrade of Transmart that they have uh, completed um, at Pfizer. And so Anna, I will give you keyboard control and you can um, uh, take, take us through your presentation. Welcome. Hi, thank you. Can you hear me? We can. Okay, so I should have control now? Yes. Keyboard control? And what do I need to do to... Just click with your mouse and, and it'll, it'll advance. Okay, it doesn't seem to... Yes. Okay. So, um, thank you so much for letting us present and discuss our experience of the Transmart 1.2 upgrade today. Uh, on this slide you can see the, our core team and most if not all of us are present in this meeting. Uh, presenting will be myself who is the project manager and uh, our technical team Hugo Berube, Hayan Sang and Ming Kui and then Alex Papa, who is our business analyst and uh, has also been uh, working with the foundation directly, so I think you know her. Actually, you've met Hayan and Hugo in, in uh, other events with the foundation as well. Uh, so uh, we have some, we have a li somewhat limited time today. If you have questions, please reach out to us also after this presentation you know, if, if, if we don't have time to discuss everything today. Okay, let's see if it's advancing. Do I have to click somewhere specifically or? You should just be able to click on the, on the screen with your mouse. Yeah. Oh, maybe, okay, now, now we did it anyway. Um, so uh, this is a, an introduction to what we're talking about today that Pfizer deployed Transmart version 1.2.2 in February this year following a four-month effort which made Transmart the enterprise solution for translational research data at Pfizer. And this upgrade included developing an upgrade path for the database and we'll talk more about that, uh, how we did that. And it also involved some uh, enhancement and bug fixing, performance tu tuning and uh, comprehensive testing in order to be able to deploy it to our internal environment. Okay, so the, our goals for today's presentation is to highlight what we did as information for others in a similar situation and also to give feedback to the community on how we can improve the support to organizations looking to upgrade to new Transmart releases uh, now and going forward. Are there things we can do to, as we're developing new releases, to help prepare for upgrades uh, when organizations have Transmart installed and ready and have data uh, in the system? And this is the outline of the agenda, so a brief introduction of Transmart at Pfizer, why we chose to upgrade, and then speaking more about what we did in terms of database upgrade, enhancements, testing and documentation, and just to reiterate considerations for future upgrades. So the Transmart environment at Pfizer has been in use since 2012. And we have users from many different teams. It's a, it's a global access uh, from different users groups throughout Pfizer. It is now a safe harbor compliant environment where safe harbor uh, addresses um, consideration around personal information. And what that means is that we have requirements on uh, the environment, access, documentation, verification. We already have that uh, as an industry 
and that what's what that's the the next bullet point industry process requirement is referring to that in uh, pharmaceutical companies in general uh, you know there are quite a few requirements uh, in terms of verification and documentation that we have to adhere to and that becomes interesting as you develop a new system to prepare for implementation of systems. And, and this uh, final piece is the data, uh, uh, including secured of the data, who can access this, because we have a wide user base, some data needs to be protected. So this is a slide about the data. And what it's telling us is that, that we have quite uh, an extensive set of data in Transmart at Pfizer. We have uh, genome-wide association data, uh, both regular and metabolomic. We have individual molecular data, low dimensional and high dimensional data, and we have clinical studies uh, with tens of thousands of, of clinical endpoints. And this becomes very critical and important at times of upgrades. If there's database changes, how does that affect our work and, and our uh, potential upgrade paths? Why did we choose to upgrade to 1.2? Two major areas. First, functionality. We wanted to, to get to some of the updates. Uh, the interface, the data export utilities, the new APIs, and extended data models. So we were very interested in this new version and, and being able to utilize it. But it was also strategical. To, we wanted to be in a version that supports system and data growth as Pfizer is looking to increase data loading and data support in, in Transmart this year and going forward and also to be an active participant and contributor to the Transmart community for data sharing, uh, both being able to share data out that we have worked on. For example, we have done a lot of work within or for GWAS, but also for us to be able to, to uh, faster and, and easily, more easily take uh, and upload new data that's shared in the community. Okay, so now we're getting into the part what we did, and the database upgrade is first of that. So um, we we were on Transmart release 1.0, and we had three environments: development stage and production, and we needed to get to version 1.2. Now, in the general recommendations for upgrade that we saw on the forum and in meeting was to to reload data. So we had to look into that option because there were so many changes in the database between these two releases. So our technical team uh, looked into that option, but because of the number or the amount of data sets and the complexity of the data we had in the system, it, we, we also had to consider is it possible to upgrade the database as it stands. And this is where I'm going to hand over to Ming Kui, who, who is our um, database uh, DB, or internal DBA and database structural expert. And then Hayan and Hugo are also going to take about uh, or talk about uh, our technical challenges that we had and what we did to accomplish this. So Ming, if you are you. Uh, uh, unmuted, and then if you let me know, I can advance the slide still. Um, can you hear me? Yes. It's a little, it's a little muffled. We can hear you, Ming. Oh, okay. So, so how how do I do this? Huh? Okay. Um, thank you, Anna. And uh, um, to to start. We, we have a, a three uh, version 1.0 databases. They are all Oracle when, uh, 11.2 database, each running a, a, a dedicated Linux VM server. So as, 
as Anna uh, mentioned, uh, to begin with, we, we had uh, um, four possible upgrade methods raised up by team, and uh, we explored and uh, discussed uh, them. And then the decision was made on um, the database structure upgrade with corresponding data migration and uh, integration. Um, the decision was made after the, the uh, development and the, the unit test. Uh, it was based on the testing result accuracy and uh, estimation and also uh, implementation. So for, for uh, state and uh, production upgrade, uh, we did one database upgrade uh, for both by the process. But there is a downside. Uh, it was a relative long period with no loading in production. But uh, that was a great team at the time. And uh, um, I think to mention is uh, uh, the testing I mentioned here is also made from application side. And uh, uh, we had a uh, um, testing testing and uh, user assessment testing after the uh, state database upgrade was uh, deployed. And uh, um, this diagram is focused on uh, database upgrade overview. Uh, actually, there are a lot of great effort and uh, time spent on uh, testing and study. You will get more detail uh, later on in this. How do we go to the next slide, please? Oh, no. Can I go back? Oh, sorry. Thank you. OK, thanks. So uh, this one is uh, uh, showing the, the steps um, for database structure upgrade. But, um, there are multiple ways to do it, right? Uh, here we did a uh, we did a uh, compare the database uh, the database uh, uh, structure difference between the uh, the foundation we one point two point two of the database uh, we internally installed we compared this structure with the, uh, the our earlier we point oh um, database structure we, we we use comparison and uh, generate the, the database synchronized grade by by test code for our code too. Because uh, there's some manual you can do the uh, multiple email comparison and uh, uh, we we use that utility to generate. It. And by database all get the hundreds of those. And then our uh, team worked uh, closely right, to um, reveal the differences and uh, um, to resolve the any, any problem within the uh, And then we uh, revealed the final difference. We need to do or uh, we assess. And uh, that's about all we did with the uh, uh, structural upgrade. And uh, uh, then Haiyan did a lot of the data, um, the data uh, migration and, uh, um, and uh, uh, all the rest of the uh, data changes. Haiyan will uh, talk more about that. Haiyan, please. Hayan, are you on mute? Anna, who, yep. who, 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 okay, never mind. Okay. Yep, we're, we're, yep. 
Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I was uh, I, I think I was unmuted. Uh, so I'm going to talk about the data integration and the migration. Since we didn't uh, um, uh, build the database from scratch, so we have original like 1.0, customer 1.0 data in our database, and uh, we knew there are a new function uh, that uh, 1.2 supported, and we will need some new reference data in 1.2. Uh, so we compared um, the data in our original 1.0 database and the community server the, the data in the community server database. So we go through the, we run through the tables and then um, there are um, the for some tables that was the original data um, empty or for tables that wasn't exist in the 1.0 database. We uh, just copy the data over. For example, for the AMF schema that was new to our uh, uh, trust database, so we directly copy the data, copy the table over. And for some past list that the new supported data type, and we copy those uh, type of data over as well. Uh, for some existing tables that we already have data, uh, because uh, 1.2 supported as more. Uh, more data types, and for example, for the metabolic uh, and MIRA and protein. So, for those data types, we um, merge them like a, we copy the data from 1.2 uh, community server, and then merge the, uh, them in our like 1.0 database. For example, in the search term tables, we merge them, them together, and for some. Uh, also for some other tables like uh, the markers, we originally only had the uh, genome gene in the bell marker table, but now we have uh, proteins and metabolic. Um, so uh, that is the uh, most uh, data that we migrated. But during the uh, application testing, we also realized that there are mm, some connections between the tables that we need to populate so the um, application user interface will behave properly. For example, for the static metadata, uh, because uh, static metadata was actually kind of linked between the AMF schema and the FMF schema. So um, we have actually have to populate the data in the AMF tables uh, to link them together. So when they click on the study, the study method data will pop up uh, properly. Um, we also realized um, there are um, um, like, uh, some tables um, in the table definition, the columns are, are actually novel. So it is a low, low value. But uh, um, when we test it on the application side, if there is a null value in the column is actually the application won't behave, uh, will have some kind of problems. So uh, we fill in those columns uh, for by default values. This may be, I, I think this, um, in the future, maybe we can uh, synchronize the, the database design and the application size so they, they could match. Um, Maybe in some of the data, uh, database, we can define if it's not a low value, we can define as a like non non volume. Um, non column, sorry. Um, so, um, also during the testing, um, we found out that the data structure for the um, workspace type for the saved subset has been uh, changed from 1.0 to 1.2. And this is not very uh, intuitive to us in the beginning until we found some problem um, for our safe stuff that if it's new, there's no problem. But uh, because the structure is different, they call different things. Um, the query master ID column in the subset table actually was pointing to a different thing. It's pointing to result instance ID in 1.2. I think this is, is not very obvious to us, so we did 
but uh, uh, spend a little bit time on those things. I'm thinking in the future if we up update the application side, like uh, update the code, uh, like pointing to different things, we could update the table correspondingly. Um, so it's uh, um, to the user, like uh, when we update, we will know what's going on, what has been changed. Um, there are also some data, uh, like uh, uh, the data set or the data definition has been changed in um, different tables. For example, in the bell data UID table, the bell data type uh, for the bell IC analysis was it was typed as BAA, but uh, um, in 1.2, it was actually expanded as bell IC analysis. Um, so those many subtle things uh, we also um, need to upgrade uh, during the database migration. Um, so uh, I think that's basically what we did for the data integration and migration. I'm going to pass to Hugo. Hugo, you might need to unmute also. Oh, which one is Hugo? We can unmute him. Uh, let me see. I don't see him on the list. Yeah. Is he with you, Alex? Oh, no. There we go. Hi. 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 Good, Hugo. Can you hear me? Hi. Yes. Perfect. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, I'm going to speak about the changes due to the code base. When we started with this deployment, it was in autumn of last year, so we took the latest version, which was uh, 1.2.2, uh, and over the course of this deployment uh, and testing, internally we've identified uh, around 226 bugs that we've documented, and we've fixed about 73 uh, internally. Uh, I want to point out that also in our internal 1.0 code base, we've had, we had some enhancements that were not part of this uh, 1.2 release, which we will uh, we plan to propagate to the code base as well. Uh, I'll describe, I'll speak about that a bit more uh, at the end of this slide. Uh, so some of the notable things that we've worked on was uh, basically on the GWAS side, there's a P values under a certain number basically became zero in the database. Uh, this created some uh, discrepancy in the UI, the way that the data was being processed. So this will be fixed as far as this, re this release. We've also worked on uh, upgrading, well, I work on the stability of the guava, and there was some display issue related to the chromosome X and Y. This will be fixed as well. Uh, we've, uh, in the past few weeks, we've identified a uh, bug and an issue with basically the export of a clinical low dimensional data set when uh, the data set size is uh, large. Basically, it ends up being uh, an explosion in the data size, which basically uh, makes the export uh, process to fail. So what we've done is that we've looked at the R code and are proposed, uh, proposing an alternative in the export procedure which makes the process much faster and more stable as well. This we will uh, share this update as well. We've worked on the, the also uh, some few fixes in the ETL script in order to load the GWAS data and uh, we've fixed an issue with the GWAS security uh, model which uh, will be part of this release as well. In terms of enhancements, which we've had at Pfizer internally for using 1.0 that will be part uh, of the future foundation release, is uh, be able to use the gene signature for GWAS, uh, either using gene IDs or RSIDs. I think it, uh, this was not working in 1.2.2. And also, this has been a request by our user within Pfizer, is the ability to uh, basically attach file to different studies, whether it's on the analyzed tab or the GWAS tab. So uh, this is another functionality that we've integrated as well. Okay. Uh, next slide, please. Okay. 
Okay. Thank you. So um, I'm going to be talking about testing and documentation. So um, for this 1.2 release, uh, there are about 100 test, test scripts. Um, there are about 34 documents that we had to create um, or update from 1.0 to make sure this release happens. Um, I'm in the process right now of, of cleaning up the, um, the, the test scripts to, to upload to the wiki for the foundation. There are a couple other more documents that I'm, I'm looking for approval um, that, that the foundation can benefit from. Um, right now, we, you know, we're backtracking a little bit on, on a, the bug tracking process, but we're hoping to streamline it soon. Um, the intention is to first track it internally in Pfizer, and then around the same time kind of confirm or at least document the bugs in the foundation instance for JIRA. Um, that way, you know, uh, as the developers internally, you know, fix them or provide insight, we can, we can move that information seamlessly into JIRA. Because um, right now, you know, I'm, I'm in the process of, of uploading and, and verifying after the fact. It's a duplication of efforts. So right now, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping the next release will be a lot smoother. But um, the process is, is still to make sure that, that Pfizer and the foundation are both benefiting from these bugs and the fixes. So next slide. Okay, so uh, this is the final slide, really. And to summarize, that uh, you can see that it's it's quite a bit of, of work that um, we put into to successfully implement this release that's now in production in Pfizer. So going forward, we would suggest uh, that as new releases are being developed, that we consider these things, both on the technical side, uh, database upgrade path, uh, including many and complex data sets, and then the supporting function as testing and documentation. Is, are these things that we consider as we go along and we can build up test cases and documentation to facilitate the uptake for anybody who's looking to implement a new release? And that's it. We had one more slide with names. We have our team and, and others we have worked with within Pfizer, both business technology and, and our users, some of our key users. And now we might have a few minutes for a question or two. I know there might be a foundation questions too. But um, if Great. Let it, yeah. Great. Thank you, Anna, and uh, all the... Uh, all the members of the Pfizer team that uh, participated in, in your presentation today. And as Anna said, we're, we're at a point in today's call where uh, we have time, uh, we have about 15 or 10 minutes or so where, where we can take uh, questions. So you have a couple of options. Uh, you can raise your hand and I see Dirk uh, has already done so. And so Dirk will um, unmute you momentarily. Um, and then, um, um, you also have the option of, of putting uh, or typing questions into the question window. And then before we get to those, Kevin, can I just uh, break in for one second? Absolutely. Uh, I just like to say that's a, an impressive piece of work, and uh, you know, from the perspective of the foundation, uh, you really show how how the platform is a, an enterprise class platform, and the kind of effort it takes uh, internally when you're running this enterprise wide. Uh, I think you also showed a lot of the, the benefits of doing that. So that, that's a, a terrific presentation, and I certainly want to reach out and thank you and you know, Jay and Mateo and, and the, the team that is, has led that together. Uh, but I think this is a terrific demonstration. I will ask one question, which is um, you guys have done a lot of work. I think I noticed there were 200 and some bugs that have been identified, 70 some that had been fixed. Um, are those things that have been contributed back to the, uh, to the platform? That's my key question. We're working on that right now. That's uh, what we're going through, and that's what Alex and Hugo were referring to, it, that, that that's being done right now to compose the list and su submit that back to the foundation, and all, including code for the ones that we have fixed. Well, that's, that's fantastic. I think this, is, this really demonstrates how the community needs to work together. I think when you put that kind of effort in and you find those kinds of things in the course of what you're doing, uh, we certainly as the foundation, I think everyone as a community, 
wants to incorporate that back into the platform and make sure that you know people aren't fixing the same bugs two, three, four different times that we get them all together. So I really appreciate the, the extra effort you're going through to make that happen. Thank you. Right. Yeah, so like right now we're, um, we're actually, I'm going through and validating any issues that are currently on the foundation. Like I'll go with, I'll look at my bugs from internal. I'll test them against the foundation. If, if there is a bug or if that bug is available then, then I'll document it. But there is another step that once I go through this first phase of uh, documenting or providing to the foundation bugs that we don't find on the foundation site that might have already been fixed or might come up. Um, just so at least there's some type of, of, you know, notice that this had occurred at some point. Um, so I'm still trying to, you know, I'll talk to, you know, Terry and some other people about how, how best to document that information. But um, that's the process right now in the first phase, is just to get the ones that are currently on the foundation site um, that we have documented, either a fix already or going to fix, and at least put that information up immediately. Okay, so this is Jay Blazer. I just wanted to say a couple things. What you saw as a number of bugs were reported issues during testing. That doesn't mean they were a defect necessarily in the application. They could have meant that someone was trying to do something or we had a test script that wasn't quite the same at some point. Oh, because the interface has changed. I want to be very clear that those 200 some odd bugs, listed as bugs, were things that came up in testing. They were not necessarily defects. And that's why a number of them did not need remediation. Yeah. So I think it's important for everyone to note that. I think secondly, when it comes to reporting and, and working to rationalize what we found at Pfizer with the foundation, I think it's very important the next step needs to be people like Alex and Hugo working directly with Terry and the code Team to make sure that these are rationalized in a way that's efficient and a way that's effective. So, and I think now is the time that we want to reach out to, to Terry to make sure the process of, of getting this information and getting these fixes back to the foundation is done in a, in a productive way. Yep. No, and I think, Jay, I, I really appreciate the effort you guys are going through to do that because that benefits everyone in the community. So, uh, it's very much appreciated. Great. Thank you. So Dirk, I am going to unmute you. You've had your hand up for a while and give you an opportunity uh, to, to comment um, or ask questions. Yes, um, thank you. It was a very informative presentation. And I just, I'm going to ask a very general question, or I mean, I guess it's very specific, but it's very broad, which is, could Ming or someone comment on the size of the database that was migrated? I'm just curious about the overall size of the database migration. Uh, okay, I can comment that uh, our our current production is a uh, production database is uh, uh, about 1.3 terabyte, and uh, the development uh, database is uh, slightly below one terabyte. Thank you. Um, Hey Derek, are you are you are you suitably impressed? Yes, I am. Well, and I I was also just trying to figure out how all those studies add up to volume in the database. So, yes, I am suitably impressed. I know I've been involved <laughs> with some of our ELN migrations that are actually several fold bigger than that, but yeah. but this is good to hear in this regard as well. I I I don't know how I don't have a clear idea of how studies translate into database volume, especially on the Oracle side. So, um, I, I Actually, this is why I unmuted. So, so basically, most of the data that the bulk of that volume of the 1.3 terabytes is our GWAS collection, right, which is, which is substantially large. Now, granted, we have probably 20, at this point, 25 to 30 standard translational studies in the Analyze tab. But those, those, of course, tend to be much smaller in the volume. So most of the volume is our GWAS, our GWAS collection. And I figured as much, yeah. Yeah, OK, just, I, I just assume, but I'll just say it. Right. Well, thank yeah, you. Yeah, I said on this one, uh, actually, we have a, a one single uh, GWAS table. It's uh, um, over 500 uh, gigabytes in the database. Great. 
Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, Ward, uh, you also have had your hand up, so I'd like to give you an opportunity to comment or ask a question. Thank you, Kevin. Um, and I totally want to start indeed by thanking Pfizer for this, this nice presentation. This is exactly what we need and shows the power of the platform. Um, relating to this, I also want to mention that uh, this week also officially trade has gone into um, official production deployment with uh, 1.2. So it's great that we're all on the same track. Uh, definitely, we're looking also forward to the to the bugs uh, that were fixed in Pfizer. Um, and related to that, um, I think you already mentioned that the bugs and the test scripts will be brought back to the community. Um, the database upgrade scripts might also be useful for people who are, have a big data set and are still on 1.0. Will these also be brought back? Hi. Yeah, so um, I mentioned that, that we're in the process of, of cleaning it up um, and, and updating it, and we're going we're gonna to put them on the, uh, the wiki. Ward, I do have an email from you from yesterday, so I am going <laughs> to email you back about meeting um, oh, in great, the next yeah. few days. So sorry, I didn't mean to ignore you. Um, Don't worry. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so there is the intention is to, to provide the, the scripts and, and um, any updates to the scripts back to the foundation as soon as possible. Just to be sure, you, you mean the database upgrade scripts, right? Or the test scripts? Oh, I was talking about the test scripts. What do you... Yeah, <laughs> we haven't oh, talked okay. about the database uh, upgrade scripts. Um, so uh, I would have to check, you know, with, with Jay and others. Yeah, I can understand they're really specific probably for your data. So. Right, and uh, we, we did a comparison of between the, the foundational version and the, uh, our internal cyber database. I don't yeah. know how much how much um, customized uh, structure and the data we have. So uh, we do have all those scripts available, but uh, uh, when, uh, we, we talked about that before. But uh, we're not sure if just uh, our scripts can, can be used uh, exactly to other places. And then, yeah, uh, I that even for our uh, development and uh, uh, stage and production, we actually we compare it uh, separately. It's not that we are reusing one script. We didn't. Yeah, just, just for, for each just database. Yeah. So just real quickly, in terms of the uh, database update scripts, I mean we're telling y'all about this because we want to help, right? If someone if someone has got a big enough mm -hmm. collection of data. That it makes more sense to try to try to have an upgrade pass through the database rather than reloading, mm -hmm. then then we want to help. And and I don't see any reason why Pfizer wouldn't be able to to release the code. I mean, I granted that code is made because it's not transmart, but I, I honestly I don't see the impediment. And if we have to go back and ask the question, I I honestly just don't see the impediment. And if that will help people, that's what we want to do. Okay, so maybe if people are really interested in this, they need to contact uh, us, and then we could work together on. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Getting this out. Great, thank you. Thank you, Ward, for your questions. Uh, Dave, John, um, you, know, you you had uh, posted a couple of questions, and give you a chance to uh, articulate those yourself. Yeah, so it sounds like you guys moved a lot of data, which is great. Um, I'm just curious, how long did the upgrade take, and and how did that compare with your expectations expectations of how long it was going to take? Um, it, it seems like a lot of work, and I just kind of want to get an idea: was it ex your expected effort, or was it a lot more than that? Well, I'll, I'll start the, 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 as from a product manager perspective. Uh, the technical team can comment as well. Uh, in our case, we had a deadline set. So we had to to do it really uh, on a on a a very aggressive schedule and so it depends on what you include in how long the upgrade take to it take you know what you include in that because in the beginning really what took time was to decide to evaluate our technical options that took us I would say a month or so to do and then and then to do it and then we have the testing and documentation so all in all we said four months, but that was a very intense effort. 
And that's what we're looking for. I see there's another comment there. You know, for future updates, how can we make it more easier up front so there is a path and, and uh, a, a faster way of doing it? The other question yeah, I have. Go ahead. Actually, I'm sorry, just to answer Dave's question, I mean, uh, Hyann or, or Ming, I, I mean, what was the, in terms of running the update script, you know, uh, you know, forget everything else, Seth, but just running the update script, how long did that take? Because I think that may be what Dave was aiming at. Okay, so for uh, database structure upgrade, uh, the, the uh, time, is, uh, uh, it was about one week to upgrade all the, the uh, schema. Uh, for the data migration, I think the first time I used like a two to three days, but the second time because we know already upper testing is only used one day. Yeah, because okay. we have different environments, we have to do it multiple times through the process. That's a pretty quick turnaround. That sounds pretty fast. But what we, what we, do we, get, we yeah, it's what we do, Dave. <laughs> no, I get it. That's great. Um, the other question I had was a little bit unrelated, but uh, slightly related. So I know you guys are tracking bugs internally, but also against the foundation, um, Jira. And I just think, as a community, we probably need to have a a, a better way of doing that, so we're not. Um, duplicating effort. And I was just wondering if you guys had any thoughts there based on your experience or um, is that something we should try to just figure out as a community overall? I think that um, like we need to document, I don't know, I, I'm duplicating efforts right now, right? Because we had development has already been deployed and now I'm going back and I'm literally retyping everything into JIRA. Um, so I think maybe the process that, that, you know, if I could give it advice to other people is, you know, as the development is going through, you know, you can document it in your own internal services, but then also, you know, find a way to copy it over quickly to, to JIRA um, for the foundation site. Um, I know, you know, for the next release, I think one thing that we're interested in doing is testing it internally for, well, first testing the foundation site. Um, oh, we have to go. Just finish the sentence. Sorry, guys. We're just kicked out of the room here, so uh, Alex, take, take 10 seconds. Okay, all right, all right, I'll go. No pressure. Um, so we want to, I think we're going to evaluate the foundation update um, on the foundation site, track bugs there, and then move it over to Pfizer, test it there. So that way, when we look at bugs, we're trying to figure out, okay, is it a foundation bug? Is it, a, is it an internal Pfizer bug? Um, so that's kind of the advice I have. Okay. Great. All right. Well, thank you both. Great. Thank you. Um, Julie, you had also posted uh, a question, which I think Keith may have answered. But uh, why don't you go ahead and state your question, and then uh, Keith can reiterate, I think, uh, 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 a new position within the foundation that he described at the beginning of the call today. Yeah, I, I was just saying, uh, great presentation. Thank you very much, guys. Um, but we. we definitely need an upgrade path and um, anybody who's done these upgrades knows how painful they can be and how long they can be and, and they probably shouldn't be. So um, I wanted to reach out to the development team, you know, the people who are working in development. Um, is it on the plan and on the map that we, we will have an upgrade path and if so, when, when we see that actually happening? Well, I, I can't speak for the developers directly, but um, you know, from the foundation perspective, uh, I think an upgrade path has always been in our key. And in fact, as we think about you know uh, the release program that we put in place for version 1.2, is uh, you know with all the different release pieces, these are uh, drop-in uh, patches, and they don't involve any changes to the underlying data structures, which has been a really critical part of that release process. As we go forward, uh, one of the key things that I've discussed with EK and with Jay and, and others on the code side is uh, when we do a, a version 2 development, we want to have backward compatibility. Um, we are working with an enterprise class you know, platform. Uh, listening to, to Jay's efforts here where they've, they've worked with a database containing over a terabyte of data and worked through upgrade, you know, this is not a trivial task. 
uh, I think that um, as we go forward, we want to make that much more facile. But uh, I don't think we're going to be at the at the point of you know dropping in a patch to Microsoft Word as we do with, with desktop apps. I think we're always going to have to be really careful about the underlying data structures, the underlying database, uh, how people are working with those, et cetera. But it's a key design goal and for us to have this kind of, of upgrade path and uh, backward compatibility as well. Uh, toward that end, we have brought on board um, uh, Jay Farron, who's a, a commercial uh, QA, QC uh, testing and release uh, architect. Uh, Jay um, has uh, a background working with companies like uh, EMC, uh, uh, Softscape, and, and others, and uh, really understands the sort of the commercial aspects of this and working with a commercial uh, set of customers. So he's uh, been engaged now with, uh, with Terry and with Peter, uh, working on how we design this into our testing and release program, and then how we do this on an ongoing basis to make sure we have upgrade paths and more. So that's, that's a, a definite area of focus, Julie. Good to hear. Anything else, Kevin? Did we lose Kevin? P uh, I, no, I'm here. Um, Peter Rice has a question. Um, Peter? Uh, I was just going to say that Yes, we're also aware with eTrix for the um, need for an upgrade path. It's, of course, rather complicated when you're doing it from your internal 1.0 Oracle version to 1.2 Oracle and Postgres. Um, so I think the, the upgrade script you used is probably the one we used for the Oracle Postgres merge, which I, I sent to you and you probably played with it. Um, we could certainly use your experience in building an upgrade path um, from the things that you needed to change and at least try to build one that will take you from 1.2.x to 1.2.x plus 1 for the transport upgrades and to help guide anyone migrating their internal versions as everyone's going to have to do to get to the, the standard version. So we're part of the way there and I think we can certainly build on that as a development team. Thank you. Uh, any other questions or comments before we conclude today's uh, monthly community call? So, Keith, as usual, I'd like to give you the opportunity to close out um, our call today. Thanks, Kevin. Uh, no, I just want to say thanks again to the Pfizer team. Uh, I think this is a, a real fantastic uh, demonstration of, of, uh, of what it takes to, to migrate from 1.0 uh, 1 to 1.2. Um, it's, it's also fantastic that you're sharing this with us and you're sharing the experience and uh, and the bug fixes and more. I think this is really where the spirit of community comes alive uh, in what we're doing together. Um, I look forward to uh, to having others. What I heard from uh, from Ward is that uh, trades going through the same process, and, and we we hope to have them uh, make a similar kind of presentation. Uh, going forward to the next month, uh, we've got a lot of focus going on the datathon, the BioIT world events coming up, uh, various things there. Um, I will. Uh, want to motivate all the 3C committee members and working group members to, uh, to come to those meetings in Boston uh, the week of the 20th. Uh, I think that uh, there's a lot, a lot of work happening on the ground, and if you want to be involved in it, that's the way to go. And uh, with that, I think, Kevin, uh, it's, it's been a really good community meeting. Thank you for putting this together, and I look forward to uh, talking to everyone in a month. Thank you, everybody. We'll see you all in Boston. <laughs>